Hi, I'm Sostein. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode. Today's episode, we're going to talk about court suits, in particular, this court suit. This is the Count Fersen court suit from 1785, which is in the Nordiska Museum in Sweden. Count Fersen, as you may or may not know, is most famous for possibly having had an affair with Marie Antoinette. He certainly was a favorite of hers and one of her courtiers, and there is a lot of evidence to suggest that this was in fact possible. So this court suit had been on my list for years. However, I chose not to make it forever because I really did not like the flowers. If you look at them, they're very abstract and very odd and just kind of weird looking. They're not naturalistic at all. Regardless of the oddness of the flowers, I still love it and overall it gives a very charming and wonderful effect. I mean, look at those little buttons. It's absolutely fabulous. So to start making this coat, I actually started by digitizing the flowers. I picked a bouquet on the pocket that I particularly liked and started by digitizing flower by flower. Each flower takes somewhere between half an hour to three hours depending on how complex the flower is to digitize. So I went ahead and just did one flower at a time. I can't really tell you how long this took me, but I did spend several weeks at it. This happened until I had a bouquet of flowers and then I went ahead and basically copy pasted that bouquet several times over into a file of the shape of the front panel of the coat. Now this is just for the front panel. I of course did this for the collar, the cuffs, the back panel, the pocket, and everything else. But let's just talk about the front panel for now. And after I went ahead and made the complete file with all seven pieces, I went ahead and broke down the large file into seven smaller pieces, each of which would fit into my hoop that was 14 by 8 inches. This, what you're looking at here, is actually one of the pieces. This is the one closest to the neckline. So then I went ahead and actually drew out the shape of the coat. This is the front and the back panel that you see there that I'm tracing out on, in chalk on the silk fabric. After I went ahead and did that, I placed the hoop in a way that I knew that it would actually conform to the shape of the file. This actually took several tries. Here you see my attempt number one. I took about six or seven attempts so I got the exact angle of the coat right, but that's actually one of the hardest parts. So um, getting that right is quite difficult. So I go ahead and I hoop it, I pin it, and then I put it into my machine. And then um, you're not gonna see the actual att different attempts, but um, eventually I did start embroidering. Now each repeat takes somewhere between four to eight hours, 10 hours for some of them to actually stitch out. Now, to do the insertion netting, which the original also had, I went ahead and I put a piece of silk netting on, let it stitch out the border of it, I cut out the border, and then I went ahead and started the entire design on top of that border. Now the border there looks very messy, but by the time that the stitch out is done, you're going to notice that the entire edge of the border is completely hidden by silk stitches. The thread that I use is a tire silk thread. I always talk about this. It's a Japanese silk embroidery thread. Unfortunately, I don't think Americans, and that this includes me, really have much use for silk embroidery. In Japan, I believe they use it for a lot of kimonos. Here, we don't really do silk embroidery. Most of the embroidery that we use is either rayon or polyester because we need it to be machine washable. Think about it. It's on hats. It's on polos. It's not really on anything silk. So. For this reason, uh, this thread is very hard to come by, but I do end up loving the colors that they have, and it's very, very hard to source. So I am at the point where I have bought all the silk thread from this continent, and I am actually having the thread shipped in from Japan, which makes me feel terrible, because, oh my god, I'm buying silk thread directly from Japan. Anyways, here you see the machine going, and oops, that's a mis mistake right there. You can see it, but... Um, eventually I go ahead and realize it and I actually tear out those stitches and then I let it continue. Um, now one thing I want to add about machine embroidery is it's not really this peaceful. It doesn't just go for a very long time. This is at about 2,000 to 3,000 speeds just so you can actually see it finish and it actually takes 
a very long time and there's a lot of times when the stitch actually breaks where this uh, silk thread runs out where the bobbin breaks where the needle breaks and I actually made a point of removing a lot of those errors I left a couple of those in just so you could kind of see and get the real feel of it but honestly each repeat probably has about eight or nine um, like breaks in it where I have to go ahead and rethread the machine completely or at least the needle, or at least part of it. It is not a let it just go and run and I come back six, six hours later. It really is a concerted effort on my part to keep the machine going for several hours. So I cannot just have it go. I'm very lucky if the machine does 15 minutes without breaking a single stitch. So from here on out, for about the next two minutes, I'm going to just let you enjoy the machine stitching with some music. <laughs> That is the most beautiful sound in the world, the sound of my machine finishing properly. You'll notice that I put a little cut, a horizontal line right there. And basically that horizontal line is literally just there so that I can help with placement for the next design. The line should be at the top of the hoop or close to the top of the hoop and it should be completely horizontal. This makes sure that the angle of the next piece is right on target. Here you can see that I have put the plastic um, roller on top. This actually comes with the hoop. There's a hole right here to show you how it should lie flat. And actually, um, each square is one centimeter by one centimeter, and it lets me know how close to straight my horizontal line is. Um, here I'm fairly straight. It could be a little straighter, so I'm going to adjust that a little bit. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but the closer to perfect it is, the nicer it looks at the end, so I'm pretty finicky about that. And I've made the design, so I know that this hoop needs to go almost to the edge there. Let's see. And I'm going to take a quick peek. You often don't know until it's about, it's about two millimeters off. I'm going to redo it. So, and uh, as you can see, it's, it's kind of, getting this right is the tricky part. Yeah, that's good. So as you can see, it's about three millimeters from the bottom there, three millimeters from the bottom there. And I'm going to go ahead and just kind of stretch this hoop out so that the fabric's nice and tight again. And then I'm going to pin it and I'll see you back at the machine. So I can go ahead and press this button right here, which actually makes it a camera. Now that green dot right over there tells you where the design's going to be. 
And right now I selected the top right corner. I could also select the top middle, the middle of the design where it would potentially go, or the, in my case, I just want to hand press that one. And then I can go ahead and move the actual design. where I think it should go. Now where I think it should go is not necessarily where it's going to go, so then I go ahead and double check it by checking the actual stitches. Now that I know that the stitch is going to be right there, you can see the little green dot right there, I can go to my design and check the needle placement to make sure that's exactly where I want it to be. I want it to be just a little higher than that. So I'm gonna go back, move my design, and then I'm gonna check the spot again. That's right. Okay, that's perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So here I finished five of the repeats for the design out of seven for the front panel portion and three for the pocket. I'm not going to show you the whole process again and again, obviously, because that gets really tedious. But I did want to show how it looks in the middle when you're really starting to see it start to come together. So at that point, I went ahead and did the seven, it's actually seven for the front line, and then I went ahead and placed the pocket. And I'm, I'm gonna show the pocket placement because I actually did draw a horizontal line um, where I wanted the pocket to be, so I went ahead and placed that pocket, after which I went ahead and placed the two other fl flowers to follow it. And after all that was done, at that point, I was actually kind of done with the front panel. Oh my god, it's done. I have just finished the 10th repeat on my dress. I say repeat even though really there's not that many repeats. All of them are individual pieces. And But the 10th part is done, which means the entire front panel is finally all done. So what you're seeing is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 repeats down here, 8, 9, 10. Six hours, four, 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 five, six, eight, ten, four, four and a half. I don't even know how that is. Maybe 50, 60. I don't know. Oh my god. I don't, I, I mean, I could do it. I just don't feel like it. Oh, it's done. And what we're going to do next is then I'm going to go ahead and actually cut out the piece. We'll clean it up. And then I will go ahead and put in the pocket, put the pocket over it, like, you know, the pocket piece over it. And then um, after all that is done, we then sew it to the back, which has yet to be embroidered. But um, you know what? The front panel is now fully embroidered. So it's, it's huge. It's absolutely huge to me that I finished one front panel because that's one of the two biggest pieces. But that's two pieces out of so many. I still need to do two front panels, two back vent panels, four cuffs, two collars, two pockets, two waistcoat panels, two waistcoat pocket panels, two waistcoat collar panels, and then that's not even counting everything for the buttons, for the breeches. Oh my god, there's just so much to do. So as you can imagine, it's, um, it's a very overwhelming project, but at the same time, it's still my absolute favorite of projects. I did not actually end up cutting out the front panel next. I actually ended up realizing I could actually squeeze in a back vent panel um, next to it. So I went ahead and embroidered that. That's actually in four pieces. It's about 20 hours to embroider the whole thing. It's actually pretty nice. It's about a day and a half of just doing embroidery. So I managed to do that onto one of the pieces. And then because the fabric itself is so weak, I actually have to flatline it. So to flatline it, I went ahead and I cut out the pieces first. I did this by first going ahead and laying out the blue embroidered panel, and then I put it, the actual cotton 
pattern piece on top and I cut that out after tracing it. After I went ahead and cut that out, I used the pieces that I had cut to cut the flat lining out of cotton twill. I chose cotton twill because cotton twill is very strong. I've used it as just an interfacing before. It's relatively cheap. It's about six dollars a yard if you buy it in bulk like I do. And it actually does a very good job for flat lining for very thin fabrics. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about the flat lining process here because it's a little different than how most people do it. I don't want the embroidery to be flat lined by itself per se. I want it to be flat lined along with horsehair interfacing. I use horsehair interfacing because it's affordable and it really does a job very well. I use Pellon horsehair iron-on interfacing and the iron-on portion is ironed onto the cotton twill. I cut out the piece and I will actually iron it on about half an inch from the edge and then I'll go ahead and use the iron to iron fold over the edge as I will. As for the actual silk piece, after I've cut out the pieces, I go ahead and I will actually iron the edge along the white border. After I've ironed it, I use a actual hem tape. I like to use um, heat and bond 3 8 inch um, tape to go ahead and iron it down so that the edge that is embroidered doesn't really go anywhere. After all that is done, I actually will hand whip stitch the um, the black cotton twill along with the horsehair interfacing to the actual fabric and that I found actually gives me the best lay of fabric. This is my personal experience when I'm working with very thin fabric like this. Yeah, this is a broadcloth as I said from Sartor but at the same time even though it's broadcloth doesn't mean it's absolutely immune to kind of being all that wibbly wobbly as you see over there. So now that we've finished stabilizing the front panel, you can see how flat it lies. I think this is a good place to stop for today. Thank you for joining me today and please subscribe if you want to see how this coat turns out. <laughs>